My last three books, Death of the Liberal Class, which looked at the collapse of all of the traditional mechanisms by which we made incremental and piecemeal reform possible, how that happened, decimation of the movements that opened up the space in American democracy, Empire of Illusion, the End of Literacy, and the Triumph of Spectacle, which examined the rise of the image-based, spectacle-based society. Totalitarian states are always image-based and spectacle-driven. Severance from a print-based culture, the infusion of sophisticated forms of propaganda to make us confuse how we are made to feel with knowledge, the pornification of American society, the commodification of human beings. And the last book, which I wrote with the cartoonist Joe Sacco, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, which examined the sacrifice zones in America, starting with Pine Ridge, South Dakota, looking at Camden, New Jersey, per capita, the poorest city in the United States, the coal fields of southern West Virginia, our produce fields, places where unfettered, unregulated capitalism have destroyed the environment, communities, families, and finally lives, their health, their physical health, their psychological health. And we wrote that book because we believed it was incumbent upon us to look closely at those sacrifice zones now that global capitalism has made us one vast sacrifice zone. This book is different. I no longer analyze or dissect the collapse of American democracy, the corporate coup d'etat that has taken place, the imposition of what our greatest living political philosopher, Sheldon Wolin, who's in a retirement community about an hour from here, calls our system of inverted totalitarianism. He lays this out in his book, Democracy Incorporated, arguing that it is not like classical totalitarianism. It doesn't find its expression through a demagogue or a charismatic leader, but through the anonymity of the corporate state. That in a classical totalitarian regime, you overthrow a structure and replace it, its symbols, its iconography, its language. But in inverted totalitarianism, you have corporate forces that purport to pay fealty to electoral politics, the language of patriotism, the Constitution, the free press, and yet internally, have seized all of the levers of power to render the citizen impotent. And this book begins from that analysis, that understanding that our democracy has been extinguished, that the consent of the governed has become a cruel joke. Over and over, what we as citizens demand, or what we as citizens once assumed as part of our rights within a capitalist democracy, have been taken from us. In the 2008 financial meltdown, constituent calls were 100 to 1 
against the bailouts for the big banks and Wall Street, across the political spectrum, and yet that class of global speculators and speculation in Europe in the 17th century was a capital crime and speculators were hung, passed anyway. The infusion of corporate money into our elections, the rewriting of our Constitution by judicial fiat, twisting our form of legalized bribery into a justification for corporate cash, unlimited corporate cash, as being allowed under the Constitution as the right to petition the government, the refusal by the court system to challenge the evisceration of our privacy. We now are the most watched, monitored, photographed, eavesdropped population in human history. And I covered the Stasi state in East Germany during the revolution. The use of the Espionage Act to shut down whistleblowers, essentially extinguishing any serious investigations into the centers of power. Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act, which overturns over 150 years of domestic law and permits the U.S. military to seize American citizens who, quote-unquote, substantially support the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, or something called associated forces, another nebulous term, strip them of due process and hold them in military facilities, in the words of that section, until the end of hostilities, which in an age of permanent war is a lifetime. And as some of you know, I sued Barack Obama in federal court over Section 1021 in the Southern District Court of New York, and we won to the surprise of the Obama administration. And when Judge Catherine B. Forrest wrote her opinion after the ruling, she said that she struck down that law, she issued that temporary injunction because it opened the way to criminalize an entire category of people. And she brought up the internment of 110,000 Japanese during World War II. The response of the Obama administration was chilling. Not just government attorneys, but attorneys for the NSA visited her chambers the day of her ruling, and in the name of national security, asked her to revoke her decision to lift the temporary injunction. And to her credit, she refused. That was a Friday afternoon. By 9 a.m. Monday morning, they were at the appellate court, the next highest court, the Second Circuit, demanding the same thing. And unfortunately, the Second Circuit agreed. And why? The lawyers and I wondered why. We knew they'd appeal, but why did they act that aggressively? And I think the only thing we could determine was that they're already using the law, most likely against U.S. Pakistani dual nationals in places like Bagram. And if that injunction was allowed to stand, and if those U.S. citizens were able to escape captivity, they could hold the government in contempt of court. And how did the Second Circuit justify what is patently an unconstitutional misuse of the military as a domestic police force, empowering 
soldiers to carry out acts of extraordinary rendition on the streets of American cities. They did it the way the courts have been functioning, especially after 9-11. I was a plaintiff as well in Clapper versus Amnesty International, which before the Snowden revelations had challenged the FISA Amendment Act. And the government attorneys had reached the Supreme Court, told the court that the charge made by myself and the other plaintiffs that we were under surveillance was speculation, and then went on to say that if we were being watched by the government, we would be told. <laughs> and believing the government attorneys, the Supreme Court denied our standing, our right to bring the case, and the Second Circuit, waiting for that ruling, turned around and said, if Hedges does not have standing as a plaintiff in Clapper versus Amnesty International, then he does not have a standing in Hedges versus Obama. And the case was thrown out. And it is law. And yet there, when they ran opinion polls on that section of the NDAA, it had a 97% disapproval rating. And it is law anyway. The TPP and CAFTA, which no one wants, the destruction of our tepid environmental regulations, what are left of them, the further disempowering of the American working class, trade agreements being rammed down our throats by corporations, and the specter of elected officials not being allowed to speak to us about what are in those agreements even if they take notes. When they leave the room, those notes are confiscated. Over and over, example after example, we see that we no longer count with the rise of a corporate oligarchic elite. Unfettered, unregulated capitalism has no internal constraints, and when you strip away the external constraints, it commodifies everything. Human beings become commodities, the natural world becomes a commodity that it exploits until exhaustion or collapse. And that is why the assault on working men and women is intimately twinned with the assault on the ecosystem that sustains life itself. So this book asks something different. It begins from the belief that the mechanisms, including electoral politics, that once made reform possible are irredeemably broken. And it calls for revolution. It calls for an overthrow of corporate power. It calls for acts of mass civil disobedience that disrupt forces that, if left unchecked, will extinguish all of the systems of life, including the natural world, that we depend on for existence. And what will that rebellion look like? I've covered war. I know violence. I fear it. I understand it's poison. And yet, I'm not a pacifist. I was in Sarajevo when it was being shelled by the Serbs, 2,000 shells a day, constant sniper fire, four to five dead a day, two dozen wounded a day. The city was surrounded by a trench system for three and a half years, and we knew that if the Serb forces broke through those trenches, a third of the city would be murdered, 
and the rest would be driven into displacement and refugee camps. And that was not a supposition. It was what we had seen in the Drina Valley and in Vukovar. And at that point, when you are faced with forces bent on your own annihilation, you employ violence. There was no discussion in those basements under that siege about pacifism, and yet the tragedy is that once you use violence, even for a purportedly just cause, you become contaminated by it. In wars that are about self-preservation, as that war in Bosnia was for the Muslim-led government, or in wars that are about overthrowing colonial occupiers, the war of independence in Algeria, the war in Vietnam, the wars being waged in Iraq and Afghanistan, violence has an efficacy that can work. But revolution is different. And we speak about the American Revolution, but that's a misnomer. The American struggle was the overthrowing of a colonial occupier at the time, the most potent imperial power on the world, Prussian mercenaries marching through New England, one of the largest armadas ever formed by the British to shell and then occupy New York. But revolutions are internal affairs that pit citizen against citizen. They have a different dynamic. And in fact, although violence can be part of a revolution, successful revolutions are fundamentally nonviolent. Because, as the great theorists of revolution, Crane Brinton and Davies and others have pointed out, no revolution is successful until significant elements of internal security defect or refuse to protect a discredited regime. We saw that in the Russian Revolution with the Petrograd bread riots, the Cossacks arrived, the enforcers of the Tsar, and refused to fire on the crowd. They rushed the Tsar back from the front and he abdicated in a railway carriage. When the Shah fled Iran in 1979, one of the most well-equipped, well-trained, sophisticated military machines in the Middle East would no longer defend his discredited regime. This was true in Cuba when Bautista fled. It was true in Nicaragua when Somoza fled. It was true in East Germany when Eric Honecker sent down an elite paratroop division to Leipzig to fire on the crowd and they refused. Honecker lasted as well another week in power. The secret of successful revolution is embodied in Václav Havel's great 1978 essay, The Power of the Powerless. The secret of successful revolution is living in truth and speaking that truth to power and pulling huge numbers of people into the streets nonviolently to discredit that power. The Stasi state was the most sophisticated security and surveillance state in the world until our own. And yet, once the foot soldiers of the elite tasked with the role of protecting that elite would no longer use coercion 
even that regime was finished. Anyone who has read climate change reports understands that we have no time left. March saw every single day of the month at 440 parts per million in terms of carbon emissions. The first time that's happened since we recorded, began recording weather patterns. Scientists have reported from the Arctic that the measurement of the sea ice is completely off because the layers of old ice are gone. And the rate of evaporation of the new ice is far more accelerated. Corporate forces which have seized every institution, the media, academia, the polit political system, the courts, will drive internally and exploit eternally until there is nothing left. Corporate capitalism, as Karl Marx understood, is a revolutionary force, and it is our job to break it, and if we do not break it, my children and your children will not have a future. The moment is grave and serious. And we can rely on no one now but ourselves. Rebellion is an act of faith. It does not ask what is practical. It does not ask, finally, even if it can succeed. In moments of what Immanuel Kant called radical evil, it requires an almost mystical belief that we are called to do the good, or at least the good insofar as we can determine it, and then let it go with the belief that the good goes somewhere. We do not know where. The Buddhists call it karma. It requires what the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr calls sublime madness. And Niebuhr said that in moments of extremity, liberalism is too weak and intellectual and ineffectual a force to counter radical evil. These corporate forces, in theological terms, are forces of death, and we are called to affirm the forces of life. There are windows into the world, the dystopian world, that these corporations seek to create. One of them is our system of mass incarceration. We hold 25% of the world's prison population. We are 5% of the world's population. And most of those in our prisons are poor people of color, half of whom never committed violent offenses. As you heard in the introduction, I teach in a maximum security prison. And what's heartbreaking, and the reason I don't go back to do visiting professorships in universities, 
is that in every class I teach, I find students who have more brilliance, more passion for learning, more curiosity, more honesty, and finally more integrity than in any classroom I have taught in, including places like Princeton. And yet they never had a chance. Many of them will die in prison reading Augustine or Plato or James Baldwin or Eduardo Galeano is not about a career or networking. It is about the life of the mind. And they have taught me what it means to resist under forms of draconian repression, under forms of horrific poverty and abuse. For what we have created in our marginal communities is a system of control that, as Hannah Arendt pointed out in the origins of totalitarianism, lurks like a virus in the body politic. When, she writes, and she herself, stripped of her German citizenship, rendered stateless in France without rights, when you create a segment of your population, a demonized segment that has no rights, and 94% of those in our prisons never go to trial, They have stacks of charges, and then they bargain some away for their sentences. When you create physical mechanisms of militarized police, what she calls omnipotent policing, then the moment a society erupts with the flick of a switch, those mechanisms can be used against the entire population. I taught a class in the prison on drama. We read August Wilson, Dutchman by Leroy Jones, later Amira Baraka, Baldwin's Go Tell It on the Mountain. And as an experiment, that first week I told my students that they should write scenes, dramatic scenes, from their life. I took the papers home the first week with that kind of musty smell that is the prison. I read two, three, and suddenly hit one that was brilliant. I hit another a few scenes later that was brilliant. I had attracted probably the best writers in the institution. After a couple weeks, I added another night to the class. You can only do that by telling the prison authorities that certain members of your class need remedial help. So I went in and told my 28 students that I was coming in now on Friday's night, Friday nights, and they asked who would be there, and I said, all of you. And I dropped this book, which I was supposed to be writing, and for the next four months, I helped them put together a play, which was written out of their gut. And at the end of the semester, we couldn't read it in front of the prison authorities. I invited Cornell West and the great theologian James Cone to come be our audience. And when they got to the lobby, the warden was there, and the major, the highest uniformed official in the prison was there. And they said, you're not going to your classroom. You're going to the chapel. And they escorted us to the chapel, and they brought my students in, and they had 12 corrections officers in the back of the room. 
And of course they could never read this play now, as it was, because of the retribution that would be carried out against them. And so they picked, they huddled, and picked which scenes they would read and which scenes they would not. And one of the scenes that was read came from an assignment where I asked them to write about a conversation with their mother, something they remembered from before they were incarcerated, a moment. And one of my students said, well, what if we're a product of rape? And I said, well, then that's what you have to write. And so he wrote this moment in his life when he was in a car with his half-brother in Patterson, New Jersey, and there was a gun in the car, and it was his half-brother's, and the police stopped the car and searched the car and found the weapon, and he told the police that it was his because if no one claimed the weapon, everybody would have been charged with weapons possession. And then he describes the phone call he made to his mother from the jail, and he says, it doesn't matter, Ma. I was never supposed to be here anyway, and you have the son you love. That's why he's in prison. Or the student my only A-plus last semester, arrested at the age of 14 in Camden for a knifing he did not commit, hauled into a police station, a terrified boy. None of his family was allowed to see him. It was two, three in the morning. He was weeping. He wanted to go home. And the police said, you must sign, sign, and you can go home. He spent two years in the county jail after that until he was 16 and brought to trial. And on the basis of that signed statement, he was sentenced. And he is not eligible to go before a parole board until he is 70. Over and over I hear stories like this. And in my last class, everyone left, and he remained behind for a moment. And he said, I know I'm going to die in this prison, but I work as hard as I do so that one day I can be a teacher like you. When you see what is being done to the underclass, when you recognize their dignity, their power of resistance, their affirmation of their own dignity in the face of horrific oppression, tens of thousands of our citizens held in solitary confinement. And solitary confinement isn't just being locked in your cell 23 hours a day. It is sensory extreme sensory deprivation, harsh light, total darkness, sweltering cells, freezing cells, dogs with guards that come in the middle of the night randomly, wake you up, make you gather your possessions and move swiftly to another cell, dry cells where you have no water at all. You have to beg the guards to turn it on. And they've taught me what it means to resist. That finally resistance is not about what we achieve, but what it allows us to become. I gave them the syllabus, and there was a Wednesday in March when I was not going to be in class because I was speaking in Montana. And my phone rang, 
in the hotel room in Montana, and it was the Special Investigations Division from the Department of Corrections of the state of New Jersey, and the investigator said, do you know that your students have just let a sit-down strike in our prison? And we think you're behind it. I don't know why. They would. For me, that was such a deeply moving moment on many levels because of they had heard what I had taught them. Not that I had called on them to organize a sit-down strike, but by having them read Richard Wright, Eduardo's, Galeano's, Open Veins of Latin America, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, C.L.R. James's Black Jacobins, they had understood. But what for me was most moving was that they were totally cognizant of what would be done to them and what was done to them. Not only were they interrogated for hours, not only were their cells strip-searched and most of their possessions confiscated, and not only finally were the leaders removed from the prison and shipped to another prison and placed in solitary confinement. But they themselves had become marked with inside or inside the prison complex. And yet they rose up anyway. And we must look to those who deal under these naked forms of repression within our midst, for those forms of oppression are soon to be visited upon us. Why did they pass Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act empowering the military to arrest American citizens? It was a two-year lawsuit we contacted the Democratic leadership in the House. And we told them, if you will insert into this section that U.S. citizens are exempt, we will drop our lawsuit. But they did not. They did not because they have run scenario after scenario on the effects of climate change, on the looming financial meltdown, that will inevitably strike us again as global capitalists return to their games of speculation. And they are ready, legally, physically. We see on the streets of American cities this discontent over the lethal, indiscriminate, lethal force used by police against poor people of color. March after march, Black Lives Matter, and yet they keep shooting and killing. I'm sure most everyone in this room has watched the video of police strangle an unarmed citizen to death. And yet those police walked free. And the longer the state refuses to react, the more they fuel the inevitable discontent that will lead to revolt. It is always the state that determines the configurations of rebellion. If the state had the capacity to respond rationally, to forgive student debt, to build a public health care system for all as a right, to create jobs, especially target at those under the age of 25, to declare a moratorium on foreclosures and bank repossessions. This would begin to ameliorate the suffering that is rippling across the landscape of our country. But the state responds only with force, utterly tone deaf. 
All of the mechanisms of power are now in the hands of those who do not even live in essence within our country itself. They live in what a writer for the New Yorker called a Richistan. They don't fly on commercial airlines. They don't speak to the working men and women of this country unless they're doing their lawns or cleaning their houses. And when you have a rapacious elite like that encased in the equivalent of the Forbidden City or Versailles, unplugged from the reality around them, then they wreak horrific damage. Civilizations decay in much the same pattern. Joseph Tainter in the collapse of complex societies, Redmond in the collapse of ancient societies, Jared Diamond in his book Collapse, Ronald Wright have all pointed this out. But the difference is this time there are no new peoples to subjugate no new resources to plunder. This time when we go down, the whole planet will go with us. In the book, I interview those who are endowed with these qualities of sublime madness. Julian Assange, trapped in the embassy in Ecuador. Jeremy Hammond, the hacker, who leaked five million emails from Stratfor, a private security company, which provided crucial evidence in my own trial in the NDAA case, when there was an email exchange between the FBI and Stratfor attempting to tie a group, a dissident group called U.S. Day of Rage to Al-Qaeda so that terrorism laws could be used against them. Lynn Stewart, the great civil rights attorney, imprisoned herself, released because she has terminal cancer. Mumia Abu-Jamal. All of these figures become vital in a moment of unrest, Hannah Arendt, in an essay, says, the only reliable people in moments of extremity are not those who say this shouldn't be done or we oughtn't to do this, but those who say, I can't. And Baldwin, when he writes his great essay, on the similarities between artists and rebels says that it is not so much that they are driven towards a vision as possessed by it. These figures that have the capacity to stand up and endure the repercussions of the state become the tinder that allows us to go forward. Rebellion in this moment in history is a moral act. It is about affirming what we must affirm. It is about fighting for life. It is about understanding configurations of power and not being mesmerized or fooled by the massive systems of propaganda that seek to induce a kind of collective hy hy hypnosis that blinds us to our own reality. And what will it look like? It will call upon us to physically stand up together, 
and assert an undeniable truth that many of those within the power structure understand. I was in Boston a few days ago meeting with anti-fracking activists who are in great despair as Spectrum and Kinder Morgan prepare to run pipelines from the tar sands down through the suburbs of their city. And they have done what many of us have done, petitions, letters, to no avail. And they said, what do we do? And I said, it's over. I said, the only thing left to do is to buy junk cars and drive them into the streets to block the construction equipment and take the batteries out of the cars and walk away. And do it day after day after day. You saw in Denton, Texas, a community seeking to protect the health especially of its children, ban fracking and then be overruled by the Texas Senate banning bans. That's the world we live in. The whole game of environmental regulation is fixed because the lobbyists for BP and ExxonMobil and TransCanada write the rules, not us. And the legislators who are on the payroll put it into law. And the longer we trust in a, in, in a system that has essentially been arrayed against our interests and against the ecosystem on which our children will depend for life, the more precarious the future of the human race becomes. We must find within us this sublime madness, this act of faith, and I say that to people of creeds or people of no creeds. We must make an astute analysis of power for if we do not understand corporate power and how it works, then we will not effectively fight it. We must do what all of the great movements have done throughout American history, all of those movements that have opened up the space in our democracy. When you write a course proposal in a prison, it's very different from writing a course proposal that seeks to entice undergraduates at Princeton into your seminar. Because you have to get it by prison authorities. I turned in a proposal to teach American history, our constitution, the three branches of government, and it was approved. And then I gave all of my students Howard Zinn's The People, History of the United States. The brilliance of that book is that Zinn explained that our system was designed as a closed system, one that was meant to protect the property rights of white men, and especially slaveholders, women, African Americans, Native Americans, even men without property were excluded. And then they threw in the Electoral College, and that's how Al Gore can win 500,000 more votes than George W. Bush, and George W. Bush becomes president. Had nothing to do with Ralph Nader, by the way. <laughs> 
Zinn chronicles that long, bloody struggle on the part of working men in this country to create the 40-hour work week to end child labor, to provide safe working conditions in factories and mines, and they paid for it with their blood. Hundreds of American workers died, were murdered in the labor wars in this country, which were the bloodiest in the industrialized world. Thousands were wounded. Tens of thousands were blacklisted. All of those movements that created our democracy, the suffragists, the Liberty Party that fought slavery, the civil rights movement, and all of them understood something we've forgotten. It is not our job to take power. It is our job to stand fast around a moral imperative and make power frightened of us. The last liberal president we had was Richard Nixon, not because he was a liberal or had a conscience, but because he was frightened of movements. <laughs> the Mine and Safety Act, the Clean Water Act, OSHA, all written by Nader, were passed by Nixon. There's a moment in Kissinger's memoirs, do not buy the book, <laughs> where it's 1971, and there are thousands of anti-war demonstrators around the White House, and Nixon has put empty city buses end to end as barricades around the White House, and he looks out the window, and he says to Kissinger, Henry, they're going to break through the barricades and get us, and that's just where people in power have to be. Of course, history is rewritten. This ridiculous film about Lincoln and emancipation that manages to erase Frederick Douglass. Roosevelt, who came out of the oligarchic class, was confronted by the old CIO, the Communist Party, the Progressive Party, all of these radical movements that said, if you do not react to the suffering of the American people, then you will get revolution. And Roosevelt went to his fellow oligarchs, and he said, you better give up some of your money, or you're not going to have any of your money. And that's how we got a government program that created 15 million jobs and social security and public works, and the public theater. It was not because of the tender-heartedness of the capitalist class. It was because they were frightened. They were frightened. And that's our job. As Julian Benda in The Treason of the Intellectual says, we have a choice in life between serving privilege and power or justice and truth. And the more we compromise with those who serve privilege and power, the more we diminish the capacity for justice and truth. The state is fearful. It knows how corrupt it is. Those on Wall Street understand cynically what's happening. They are stealing and looting as fast as they can on the way down, believing they can retreat into their little gated compounds and somehow survive. The very idea that you build a society based on the dictates of the marketplace is insanity. And yet these forces have total control over our lives 
and over our future. I'm not naive enough to stand here and tell you we can win, even if we stopped all carbon admissions today, we would struggle with catastrophic effects of climate change. But I am here to tell you that we have a moral responsibility for those who come after us, that even if we fail, we must stand up so that they can look back at us and say they tried. Immanuel Kant said, if justice perishes, human life on earth has lost its meaning. And that's finally what I'm calling for, a life of meaning, no longer accepting these forces of death that will doom us and doom the future of our children. Rebellion, doing anything we can to disrupt the mechanisms that seek to destroy the world around us. And that requires us to be in the street and requires us to go to jail. I don't like going to jail. It's more time than I care to donate to my government. And yet it is that moral imperative. I don't, finally, fight fascists because I will win. I fight fascists because they are fascists. Thank you. This is just a quick reminder to ask your question in the form of a question. Please do not try to give a speech. Thank you very much. You said that the Tsar began to realize the jig was up when the Cossacks joined the crowd, and I agree. I remember the 1960s and also the 1970s, and I think Nixon did a lot of those liberal things because it was a liberal Congress that passed it, and without that, you can't do that. Now, here's my question. Ultimately, when you do go, go along, and we've seen this now at, in Missouri, you know, after the police, you bring in the National Guard, and then if need be, the active guys and women. Should we not be demanding as we had back in the 1960s, a citizen's army, because that's what happened in the 1960s and 70s. They quit doing what the leaders wanted them to do. And in order to do that, you have to bring back the draft right. with no exemptions, no exemptions, and we have to volunteer to support that. All right, and let me, uh, let most me deal, of us let don't me, want to do that. Let me deal with the military industrial complex, which is the most dangerous institution in America. Um, it is swallowing a trillion dollars, 600 and some, 641, I believe, billion dollars in the House Appropriation Bill, uh, approving uh, just a week or so ago the building of uh, 12 new Ohio-class submarines at $8 billion apiece. I don't believe ISIS even has a rowboat, as far as I know. Uh, <laughs> The, the refurbishing of our nuclear weapons, $341 billion over 10 years. There's no mechanism now to thwart this cannibalization by the security and surveillance state and the military. And that's how empires die. They hollow themselves out from the inside. They expand beyond their capacity 
to sustain themselves. Our libraries are being closed. Our schools are being closed. One in four children in this country goes to bed every night hungry. Our mentally ill are thrown out on the streets. Our elderly are no longer able to feed themselves. Our chronically unemployed are no longer able to sustain their families. And the response of the state is not to check this plundering by the part of this machine, but to, in the name of austerity, impose harsher and harsher measures on the most vulnerable among us. In, in St. Louis County, 30 to 40 percent of revenues are raised by fines, fines on the poorest of the poor, fines for not mowing your grass, fines for standing on a street corner for more than five seconds. I'm not making that one up. So why does someone have their car stopped because a tail lights out and they run? Because they can't pay those fines, because they're poor, and because there are warrants for their arrest. And what is the response of the state? They shoot them in the back and they kill them. This is how empires die. Nobody wants the wars in Iraq or Afghanistan except Raytheon, Halliburton, Northrop Grumman. War is a business. And we have to break the militarization, this insane celebration of hyper-masculine values. They're not values. This belief that violence is a way to solve conflict. And so, the distortion of our society is expressed exactly through the veneration of the military as the highest good. And that is part of our movement to take down. Could you speak some to the Occupy movement and what happened to make it at least at this point, I feel like it has evaporated. Well, it didn't evaporate. The state shut it down in a coordinated effort across the country. Um, Occupy was a tactic. Uh, Occupy has fragmented and is finding its expression in the drive to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, the debt jubilee, the anti-fracking movement, the Black Lives Matter movement. All of these are residues of Occupy. And we can't get too caught up in the, high, in the emotional highs and lows of American life. Uh, Rosa Parks sat on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. It was five years later that we had the Freedom Rides. But the fact is the failure of the state to respond rationally to what it is that drove these kids in to these encampments, these kids mostly white, middle class, college educated, heavily in debt, walked out of school, had done everything right, and found there was no place for them. What Bakunin called day class say intellectuals are essential. And building bridges now with service workers and poor people of color who for decades have endured police violence and poverty and bank repossessions and joblessness, while unfortunately many in the left busied themselves with the boutique activism of multiculturalism and forgot about the primacy of justice. But justice is returning, economic justice, and as King understood, there would be no end to racial justice until there was economic justice, which is why when he was assassinated in Memphis, he was marching in the Poor People's Campaign. So I'm not worried. Um, the state is so obtuse and tone deaf and so consumed by its own greed and hubris um, that they are going to get the backlash they deserve. Hi, um, I'm working with uh, the I-735 to uh, Washington State's attempt to overturn Citizens United. Uh, what do you think of movements like this? And uh, what do you think our next step should be? Well, the problem is that you're appealing to a system that doesn't have any interest in serving the citizenry. 
the court system, the legislative. I mean, we are about to watch in 16 months the spectacle of Michelle and Barack Obama leaving office and becoming many times over multimillionaires like the Clintons. This insane catering to money. My students in the prison are kind of fascinated by Wall Street because in their neighborhood, if somebody goes into a bodega and grabs some pampers and runs down the street, they're either shot or they're in jail. And yet if you work like fooled for Lehman Brothers and defraud American pension funds and uh, college funds and retirement of hundreds of millions of dollars, you are invited to sit on the trustee board of Stanford University. The criminals are in power. <laughs> Ralph, Ralph, Nader, Ralph Nader said to me once, you know, in political terms, you and I are the conservatives because we are calling for the restoration of the rule of law. The radicals are the ones who have power, the ones who now write their own regulations and their own laws at our expense. And so any kind of resistance is good, but I think we have to look closely and read Sheldon Wolin's Democracy Incorporated. I think we have to look closely at the harsh mechanisms of corporate control and not be fooled by their very sophisticated forms of propaganda. So. Uh, I don't know if you walked around Seattle uh, or not, but there are many tents and people sleeping under bridges yeah. and stuff like that. And uh, the mayor of this city this week is in Israel pink washing uh, the apartheid system there instead of raising his voice to the U.S. government, telling them uh, the $3.1 billion you give Israel every year, I can actually use in my city here in Seattle to right. make... Uh, Sheldon Adelson and Haim Saban made it clear that they will make a bidding war for as long as it takes to get their respective candidate into the White House. Would you please talk a little bit about the damaging well, but uh, effect of Israel on But the Democratic Party is as bad on Israel. Well, I said Party. Haim Saban, who is supporting right. Hillary Clinton, so I did not exclude right. one of them. I mean, this is my problem with Bernie Sanders. Um, I, don't, I think at this particular moment in history, we have to build alliances with all of the oppressed, including the Palestinians. We can't pick which group of oppressed people we want to support and which we don't. And that is why I am a strong supporter of the BDS movement, so that we build the kind of sanctions against Israel that we built against the apartheid regime of South Africa. We're not those systems of power, whatever Obama's distaste for Bibi Netanyahu is, and I believe it's real, I know Bibi Netanyahu, I was in Israel, I covered the Middle East for seven years. Um, Obama is a captive, either willingly or unwillingly, of a system that is unable to exert any influence in a real sense on Israel at all. And again, that will have to come from us. And it will have to come through a divestment, and it will have to come from a grassroots campaign in terms of sanctions. Hi, Chris. I love you. You're a very revolting man, and I mean that in the best sense. <laughs> Last year, we tried to get an initiative on the ballot to call for a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United, and we failed to get enough signatures. If people aren't even willing to come out on the streets and get enough signatures to get an initiative like this on the ballot, how are we ex to expect Americans to form a revolution, as you say, and get out on the streets and the barricades? And this doesn't look like the kind of audience that's about to do that. So could you please urge your listeners here to help us gather signatures for this initiative the second time around to get this on the ballot so we can have a different relationship with corporations? I'm not, I don't oppose signing or petitions, but I don't think that that is a substitute for what we have to do. I think we have to look to Europe, to Greece, to Spain. Remember, 10 or 20,000 Spaniards surrounded the parliament. 
That's what we have to begin to do. It's that kind of nonviolent civil disobedience that exposes these people for who they are. Um, because the fact is, the court system has been completely corrupted by corporate power and corporate money in the same way that the electoral system has. So to appeal to elected officials who are on the corporate payroll to abolish uh, corporate money in politics is a kind of strange tautology. Uh, uh, we have to begin to find more militant mechanisms to shame them into doing what is right. Thank you for speaking today, and thank you for taking my question. My name is Sean Osborne, and I have a question. Are there any specific techniques that you would recommend for engaging and educating our indifferent friends, family, and colleagues? You know, I go back to Havel. He's an amazing guy, and I was, of course, in the Magic Lantern Theater every night with him and Dinsbeer and Klaus during the Velvet Revolution. We can't get too caught up in numbers. We can't get too caught up in who joins us or who doesn't join us. Otherwise, we'll never do anything. We have to decide for ourselves where we must be and what we must do. And we must, rather than proselytize, we must set an example the way Havel set an example from 1977 all the way to 1989 with the Velvet Revolution. Havel, a non-person, his plays were not performed, his writings were not published, and yet in 1989 everyone recognized in Czechoslovakia that he had the moral authority that no one else had, not a particularly charismatic or gifted speaker. And, and that's when I, when I talk about an act of faith, that's what I mean. In Leipzig, those demonstrations against the communist regime began with a handful of Lutherans marching through the streets with candles, maybe a dozen, maybe 15, until suddenly there were 70,000 people who joined them. But you can't speak about resistance, and you can't finally speak about hope if you don't resist, and you become, as Auden said, that ironic point of light. And remember, it's one thing for me as a writer to block the entrance of Goldman Sachs with activists, as I did, and get hauled away in handcuffs. It's quite another if you're a single mother with a job, a precarious job, with no security, you're asking more from them then I have to pay. I have a kind of freedom. I don't work for an institution. And there will come a moment. I've covered the two Palestinian uprisings, the revolutions in Eastern Europe, the street demonstrations that brought down Milosevic. There comes a moment when people have just had enough, but even the purported leaders of resistance movements don't know the trigger and don't know when that moment will happen. So on November 9th, 1989, I'm in Leipzig with the leaders of the East German opposition, and they're saying maybe within a year we will have free passage back and forth across the Berlin Wall. And by that night, the Berlin Wall as an impediment to human traffic does not exist. I have seen solitary acts of resistance that at the time were written off as utterly futile grip an entire population. In Prague that winter, there were posters up and down the streets of Jan Pollock, a Charles University student who to protest the 1968 invasion by Soviet forces and the overthrow of Dubček, went to Vensela Square, lit himself on fire, and four days later died of his wounds. When university students, and it was a non-event, it was never reported in the state media, carried his body to the cemetery, police broke up the procession. When his grave became a shrine, they exhumed his body, cremated his remains, gave the remains to his mother, and said she was not allowed 
to rebury them. A week after the communist government fell, 10,000 people marched to Red Army Square, and they renamed it Jan Pollock Square. I was in Wenceslas Square on a December night, 500,000 Czechs. And when you pull those kinds of numbers night after night, as they did in Alexanderplatz in East Berlin, or as they did in Wenceslas Square in Prague, and the police refused to use force to disperse the demonstrators, no government can survive. And on that night, there was a balcony and a singer named Marta Kubasheva came out onto that balcony in 1968. She had sung an anthem of defiance called A Prayer for Marta that was broadcast over the airwaves calling on Czechs to rise up and the response of the Soviet, the pro-Soviet regime that replaced Dubček was to destroy her recording stock, ban her from the airwaves, and in the intervening years, she worked on an assembly line in a toy factory. And when she began to sing the prayer for Marta, every Czech in the crowd knew every word. That is the moral power of resistance. And you have to have faith that, as Havel says, when you live in truth, it reaches the conscience of even those who appear passive and maybe even complicit. There's a moment I fought the black bloc in Occupy, and there's a moment, it's on YouTube, where I'm giving a talk to occupiers telling them in Zuccotti not to taunt the police. I'm not saying that what the police do is just or right. I'm not interested in revolution or rebellion being a catharsis for my anger. I'm interested in overthrowing the corporate state. Let me repeat that word in case anyone from Homeland Security is here. That's overthrow the corporate state. And I said to the occupiers, because the whole demeanor of the blue uniform police changed when the white shirts, the officers, came. And most of the egregious acts of violence, including the pepper spraying of the young women the first week, were from the white shirts. And I said, look, we only have to deal with these white shirted assholes an hour a day. These poor blue uniform cops have to work for them all day long. And a few months later, I was giving a talk in New York City, and a man came up, and he said, I'm a white-shirted asshole, and I read all of your books. <laughs> now, he's probably the only one, but I had read King, and what I had done was wrong. It was wrong. Because at every single level, there may not be many, but there are some whose conscience will be moved to do the right thing. And when that happens within structures of power, it creates paralysis. And we are already seeing the Chicago teachers strike, the teachers march through the streets, and they go into the precinct houses, and the police applaud. Or when I was arrested in front of the White House with 133 veterans, many from the Iraq and Afghan war, as we were being cuffed, with our hands behind our back. It turns out the police, most of them, are in the National Guard and have been to Iraq and Afghanistan, and as they put the zip ties around our wrists, they would whisper, keep protesting. <laughs> if we have the courage to stand up nonviolently with dignity, to endure acts of repression that are not just in the name of justice, we can harness a power that can radically transform this country and save ourselves from where we are headed. <clears throat> um.
So my question is in two parts. Uh, the first part is, in the, um, in the post-revolutionary landscape, how would you essentially avoid the problems that have bedeviled previous revolutions? So for example, you had cited the uh, Iranian Revolution and also the Russian Revolution, both of which you could argue that the subsequent regimes or power structures were arguably worse than what they replaced. And then uh, related to that is uh, during the revolution, there seems to be a tendency for the more violent fringe or the lowest denominator to eventually dominate. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding how you would try to avoid such a situation in, uh, in the United States? Well, you're right. You're right. And, it, and that's why, that is why I am so fervently nonviolent. Because once violence becomes your primary form of communication, then you not only communicate with the state you are trying to overthrow with violence, but you communicate with those around you through violence, the way Lenin and the Bolsheviks did, in order to decimate rivals like the Mensheviks or the anarchists or anyone else. Um, and, and that's why nonviolence is key. Unfortunately, it's the state that determines the configurations of revolt. And the longer that we continue to carry out acts of nonviolence and the longer the state refuses to respond, and not only refuses to respond, but in the case of using lethal force against unarmed citizens, continues to kill, the more they empower those who finally engage in counterviolence. So in the last month, we've seen police officers shot in Mississippi and New York. I don't know if those are isolated incidents. I hope they are. But the inability of the state to react rationally and the continuation of the use of lethal force against unarmed citizens creates that extreme. And then we are caught between those two extremes and it becomes very dangerous. And that's why in a moment of relative stability that we have, it is incumbent upon us to rise up now. Because if we are living in the midst of a financial meltdown, if climate change begins to take a toll that is even more catastrophic than it is, it will become harder and the state will become more draconian in terms of its control. So this is the danger of revolution. And Lenin, as Chomsky says, and, and Adam Ullaman says, carried out a, a right-wing coup, a counter-revolution. And, and Khomeini went in and wiped out the university organizations, most of which were communist, and all of the other secular opposition groups that made that revolution in Iran possible. So, this is a fear, a great fear. Uh, and, and what happens in moments like that is that people like me who remain committed to nonviolence become the detested moderates and are swept aside. So you raise an extremely important point. And we can't, I can't know what's going to happen. America is a very violent culture. And, and vigilante violence, and there's a chapter in the book on white vigilante violence is in our DNA going all the way back to the slave patrols right through to Clive Bundy. And we have powerful proto-fascist movements, the Christian right, the Tea Party, the lunatic fringe of the Republican Party, which may be the whole party, <laughs> who do what fascist movements do. They channel a legitimate rage towards the vulnerable, undocumented workers, Muslims, homosexuals, intellectuals, liberals, feminists. And that is a powerful undercurrent, coupled with the gun culture. And, and we, we have to face that reality that our backlash, when it comes, may very well be a right-wing backlash, a call for the iron fist, especially with the insane veneration of the military and military values. So I, I, share, I share your concern, and I, and I, and I want to fight it while we still can. Hi, Chris. Um, you said that it's not our job to seize power. Why shouldn't the people seize power? And what kind of revolution would we be talking about if the people did not seize power? Well, uh, power, I mean, power is always the problem. And it, it, it's our job to remain fast to movements that hold power in check. Uh, 
So I, I came here, I was here uh, two nights ago for Shama Sawan, who I support. And I certainly believe that on the local level we can make inroads. But we have in essence surrendered our agency by falsely believing that power, those in power will solve our problems. There has to be constant pressure on the powerful, even those who are sympathetic to our demands in the way that there was on Roosevelt. And Roosevelt was sympathetic, but without that pressure. And unfortunately now all of the pressure comes from the worst elements of American society, which is corporate America. And we have to rebuild that counterweight if we have any hope. So I, I, I think that it's good to vote for people who are going to be open and sympathetic, but to believe that somehow that's going to save us is a misreading of how political power works. I mean, the most, the most powerful political figure until he was assassinated in 1968 was Martin Luther King, because when he went to Memphis or Selma, 50,000 people went with him. And that's what we have to recreate. We've got time for one last question. Yeah, let's let, well, let's let her go. Let's let her go. Go ahead. Um, I, based on the uh, demographic here tonight and the fact that uh, there are movements that are, that are happening that... Um, maybe could get spoken about more, but don't because of our, the way that politics works in the United States. Can you speak a little bit to the um, bridge that maybe needs to be crossed between elders and, and older activists who've been doing this work for a long time and uh, younger folks who are also doing a lot of movement building work and how that can maybe be, uh, be more clearly um, Supported. Well, I mean, the most vital movements right now are the drive to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, the Black Lives Matter movement, and these are driven, the engine of these movements are people who are young. Um, and that's where the vitality of those, of resistance lies in the same way that, of course, Occupy was a youth-driven movement. Um, so, uh, I... I'm not terribly worried. Uh, I think that there's a political consciousness now, uh, certainly among Occupy activists, certainly among, I met a couple weeks ago with activists from Ferguson. Um, I mean, they get it. I was with a hip hop artist, uh, T Dub O, who's 27, and he, Obama invited him after the Ferguson unrest with a few other activists to the White House, and Obama asked him if he had voted for him. And T Dub O said, no, I didn't vote for you because you haven't done anything for black people. And then he said, and to vote for you because you're black would be shallow. Well, there was a political understanding that escaped most of the white liberal class. Um, voting for somebody based on their race or their gender or their identity or whatever is anti-politics. Uh, it has nothing to do with politics. I think it's important that we support people of color uh, and people who don't come out of the white male I mean, look, I mean, 500 years of white males, we don't have much to show for it. Um, we've done a pretty good job of destroying the planet and building mechanisms that have turned our countries into the most efficient killing machines in human history. Um, so I think, we're, I think all of the real energy and all of the real uh, creativity, which is coming off the ground, is youth-driven. Um, the service workers, you know, all of the work with service workers that I've seen, uh, a lot of these are former Occup Occupy activists. So uh, I think that they will come into their own, and I think those of us who come out of an older generation, uh, you know, have a duty to listen. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and to the extent that we can support. I mean, I am great friends with Cornell West, who I admire very much. Uh, we would go down to the Chelsea Manning trial. 
uh, we, we both live in Princeton, and Cornell insisted on driving, which meant that we left at 3 in the morning. I was whining one morning, and Cornell said, now, come on, we're only going to be the only two public intellectuals there. You've got to get up. And uh, we'd get to Fort Meade, and all of the MPs would instantly recognize Cornell. You weren't supposed to be able to even get in line till 10. And at 8 o'clock, the two of us, we, they didn't even check our ideas. We were driving around Fort Meade looking for the Burger King for coffee. They only allowed 27 people into Chelsea Manning's courtroom hearing. Uh, and we were, Cornell and I was the first in line because we'd already been on the base two hours before we were supposed to get in. Uh, I got a really sweet letter from her, from Leavenworth, because, you know, they wouldn't let her look. They wouldn't let her look around at the people who had come to support her. Yeah. And she wrote me a letter and said, I looked out of the corner of my eye at my sentencing, and I saw you and Dr. West, and I want to thank you for being there. And I think that... I think that people like Cornell and myself understand that it's time for us to kind of move out of the way. It's time for us to listen. It's time for us to support that generation which is coming next. Um, there's a picture when we're marching off. Cornell and I held a people's hearing of Goldman Sachs in Zuccotti Park. And then many activists and I marched on Goldman Sachs and block the entrance and there's a picture which I love of I'm walking down the street and everybody around me is pierced and tattooed and and I'm dressed like this and that's really those are the people